Hi, everybody. So welcome to today's live broadcast. It is Thursday, May 14th. It feels like it's been the longest uh, year of my life so far in 2020, but then also some things you're like, wow, that went really quick. And so it's just been interesting. You know, I think we're all transitioning to the, our new normal and we're really anticipating what the new normal is going to be moving forward. I think a lot of us have gotten a bit accustomed to our life as it is right now, but we're also really anxious for and wanting to know how long is this going to last and what's it going to be like moving forward. And so today, that's really what we're going to focus on. The point of today is for us to really think about and talk about overall returning to life. And as we start to return to life and it looks different, how will we address triggers and pitfalls that come up with our own OCD battle? One of the things we've been hearing over and over is people really worried about what OCD exposures are going to look like when things kind of go back to normal, but there's new guidelines and parameters. And then simultaneously, we keep hearing a lot of people saying, I'm scared to actually follow CDC guidelines because I'm anxious that's going to resurface my old OCD triggers that I had done so much work on, right? I'd worked really hard to not be rigid around hand washing or cleaning. And now I'm kind of told to do that. And what will that mean? And how will I how will I follow gu guidelines, but not let OCD? CD take control. So as always in the right hand, right hand column, please, please uh, post comments, post questions so we can answer them and let us know who you are, who's watching and where you guys are from so that we can say hi. Joining us today is Dr. John Abramowitz. Um, Dr. Abramowitz has written many books, published many articles, and is an expert in treatment of OCD, anxiety, and related disorders. We have worked very closely on a lot of different projects, and we have him on frequently as our OCD expert. So I don't need to go into a long introduction, but thank you so much for joining, John. We're excited to have you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me again. So if you're okay with it, we'll just kind of hop right in. You know, um, you and I were just having a sidebar conversation and we were talking about what it's going to be like even for college students and, you know, so much uncertainty. Will college go back in the fall? Um, when will we be able to hang out with our friends and feel comfortable? When can we go to a restaurant inside and not feel anxious, even as some are reopening in certain states? And let's just start there. Let's really just kind of unpack the additional anxiety people are experiencing that they've never had outside of OCD and any quick tools or tips for people to just manage that and, and really how they should handle it, right? I think one of the questions we have is like, okay, in my state, I live in Texas, we're reopening. So we're told it's safe to do certain things, but at the same time, other states aren't reopening and how do we know which guidelines to follow? In short, we don't. <laughs> Um, and just like, you know, we always hear that we have to live with uncertainty with pretty much everything in the world. I think that that applies very well here too. I, and I, and I that goes for people who have OCD for, for friends and their family members, for people without OCD in their lives. Um, we for OCD therapists, there is just going to be a certain amount of uncertainty. I think that there clearly are things that Every, people, and I don't want to say everyone, but most folks would recognize are not a good idea to do. And then there clearly are some things that most folks have agreed on and are, are you know, reasonably safe. Um, but man, there's a there's a big middle ground in there. And um, I hate to say it, but I, I, I think that it's there's going to be a lot of just kind of judgment calls, a lot of living with uncertainty. This is a good time to learn how to live with uncertainty if, if you're not good at that for now. Better than ever, right? And really... Yeah think about OCD treatment, that's what we think about, which is that the basis of it is about learning to live with uncertainty. And of course, you know, I think, and this is actually a topic I think is really good for us to bring up. And now that we start to hop into OCD and we'll start to hop into questions as they come up, I want to remind everybody of a couple things, which is that this is not a private forum. So anything you posted can be seen by others. This is not intended to replace therapy, but really it's Dr. Bramowitz and myself having a conversation, sharing information and pieces that we've learned over time that hopefully can be helpful. But but this really should not replace therapy and we will be cautious to not answer specific treatment questions. As always, if you're in crisis or your safety is at risk, please call 911, go to your local ER, visit your suicide, um, call your suicide hotline. So question that I have, and I get this all the time, and I think that it's important more, now more than ever for patients with contamination OCD is how do we differentiate between OCD 
and not OCD. And, and oftentimes it's crystal clear, right? Because we can kind of say, okay, like you tell me, does that seem reasonable? Does, but people who don't have OCD are taking things to the extreme right now. And also we don't know what's reasonable, right? Yes, clean your packages. No, you don't need to clean your packages. Yes, wear a mask. No, don't wear a mask. Yes, definitely wear a mask. And so like, how do, how do people differentiate? Any tips for that? Uh, well, you know, again, I, I I think it's difficult right now. I think, I mean, clearly with respect to the to the virus, it's difficult. With other areas of contamination, or OCD, if, it has, if you're worried about, let's say, you know, feces or chemicals or other sorts of things that don't have to do with, you know, biohazards, I guess, um, or the, the, vi the current virus, then I think it's still pretty easy to, to tell the difference. But when it comes to this, for folks who have specific fear of, of the COVID-19 virus, um, I think it's difficult. I, I mean, I do think um, that there, we probably can, I don't know if we, I don't know if drawing a line is the right thing to say, but there's probably some behavior that would be kind of even now considered extreme. If it's taking up, you know, a lot of time, more so than I think what how most people would manage with the virus. If it's getting in the way of functioning, if it's causing a great, great deal of anxiety about being contaminated, when when the risk is still generally low, we look at the number of people who are contaminated. Again, it's it's really low, so the risk to any one person is still fairly low. Again, depending on where you are, of course. Um, so I, I I would probably define it in those functional terms. Um, and so how well are you managing? How much is it getting in the way of, of, you know, whether it's relationships or if you are working or childcare or things like that? Yeah. And, 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 you know, the thing I keep saying over and over is that there's a big difference between CDC guidelines and OCD guidelines. And so again, you know, usually that's a good way to differentiate is like, is this recommended by the CDC? and not taking it any further, right? So just because the CDC says a 20 second hand wash, that doesn't mean you should be doing that 20 second hand wash every hour, right? The point is, is that you do the 20 second hand wash when you've come into contact with things that could be contaminated. But once you're in your home, if you've engaged in that hand wash, continuing to do it is now probably OCD versus a guideline. And same with things like temperature checking, right? It's been very unclear. I think that we know the guidelines are that if you have a fever, you shouldn't be going out, you know, and, and exposing, potentially exposing other people. We also know that depending on where you work, you may be temperature checked anyways, right? So a lot of businesses as they reopen are requiring temperature checks from employees or different people to enter the building. But if you are someone living at home, working from home, um, how often you should be checking your temperature is probably not super clear, but we certainly know that once an hour is not what's being recommended, right? And so again, being able to kind of again differentiate, okay, hand washing, symptom checking, body screening, making sure I don't have symptoms, making sure I can hold my breath for 10 seconds every hour because I, you know, that's when it's pretty clear at that point that it's OCD versus not. And I actually would challenge as someone who lives with OCD, I would challenge most people that I think we usually know when it's OCD. Um, that doesn't mean it's easy for us to dismiss it by any means. It's often harder for us to dismiss it. But I usually know when I'm taking things a little bit to the extreme or when really, okay, this is probably above and beyond the guidelines, but I feel like I need to do it. When there feels like there's this sense of urgency or this like required rule, it's probably OCD for me. Yeah. And your point about once you're at home, you wash your hands. And then you're good because, right? Because if, if you're doing what the CDC says, you, you get home, you wash your hands, then you know uh, theoretically things should should not be contaminated with the virus. And then it's cool to touch anything or do any exposures if you're doing that in your in your house. Exactly, and I think that that's just so important. You know, I think for a lot of us, we you know are starting to say, well, the guidelines say to do this, like as far as cleaning surfaces and doing stuff, but it's really talking about public surfaces. But how do you make sure you don't let OCD convince you that it's something other than what it actually is, right? Read it for face value. And this is where I think sometimes a little bit of reassurance, it's not OCD reassurance is okay, right? It's okay to one time for psychoeducation, ask your family member, what are you doing, right? What is, what, like to kind of gauge what is normal and, and what are other people doing versus, okay, what is OCD telling me to do? Yeah, I think it's, you know, as long as you don't ask too many people, because again, you're going to ask, you ask 50 people, you're going to get 50 different answers and then you're going to be, you're going to be confused. So yeah, pick someone that, you know, you kind of feel like, well, you know, I, I aspire to, 
be able to be as concerned or unconcerned as they are. And maybe that's the person that you're going to you know, check in with. And as you said, Liz, every once in a while, not every 10 minutes, not every hour, um, and, and legitimate questions, not just asking for reassurance. And so that person, you might want to make sure that they're educated about kind of calling you out if you're asking for, for reassurance. Hey, I already answered that question. I think you kind of probably, probably have an idea of what I'm going to say. Right. Exactly right. Um, okay, so let's hop into a couple questions. So good to see everybody. It looks like lots of people are joining. Um, one of the first questions is not related to COVID, but certainly an OCD question we can address. But I'm curious to hear some ideas on exposure work for those obsessions about not wanting to cause harm to others. The fear of causing others to die has has a, has a reason for increased concern. So actually probably is more COVID related, but really how for those of us that might have harm to others OCD and have this fear of contaminating other people or hurting other people, how do we manage that, especially in a time where lots of people are worried about that right now, right? You're hearing people kind of validate it by saying things like, well, I'm really not worried about myself, but I'm, I'm really staying strict for my mom or for somebody else. And so how do we differentiate between it being healthy versus OCD? Yeah, I mean, I and, and that's a pretty common kind of classic OCD symptom is that people have these thoughts. What if I'm responsible for something bad happening? Um, so I think in general, understanding that those actually those are thoughts that everybody has. People with and without OCD think about you know being responsible for some sort of disaster. Um, folks with OCD kind of take those thoughts really literally and seriously. And what we want to do is be able to step back and kind of say, okay, this this is the the kind of the picture that's coming up on the screen right now, but I don't have to do anything about that. I, I've been here before, had these thoughts many times before. And I don't need to take them literally. I can see them as thoughts that that everyone has. And it turns out that when we stop fighting those, stop trying to get reassurance, stop trying to do anything about them, then they tend to leave us alone. They might be at a higher or lower level, but they, they tend to, or, or I guess we tend to respond to them differently. We have a, a healthier relationship with them. If we're talking about exposure therapy for something like this, what you wanna do is you wanna practice leaning into these thoughts. So purposely write out, I, when I work with uh, folks who have this, we write out a scenario. Um, and, and it depends if we're gonna focus on, I'm not sure if this happened or not. Um, and that's for folks that have a really difficult time with the uncertainty about it, and they're checking all the time. And then there are other uh, people I work with who they they have an image of actually having done it, and this person died because of what I did or didn't do. And then we have them imagine that the the actual um, you know awful disaster came to pass, and we help them to think about it. Thinking about these things is something that we all do. Uh, every you know human being has thoughts that um, that are about bad stuff happening, and we want to learn how to be able to think about those things and have a healthier relationship to those thoughts. Yeah, and I think what you brought up is really important for us to recognize, because we, and we talk about it a lot, is that OCD thoughts are not unique to people with OCD, right? That everybody has these thoughts. Everybody has strange thoughts. I remember I was talking to my fiance the other day and I kind of said one of my thoughts out loud and he like said, why did you just tell me that? And I was like, I don't know. What are some of your thoughts? He's like, I'm not sharing my weird thoughts that I have because it's irrelevant and they're just thoughts. And I was like, well, that's a great response. Right. But it, it reminds us that, and, and there's actually been a research study done on this where they had individuals with OCD record their thoughts into um, kind of a recording and then people without OCD and they had a clinician or had clinicians differentiate to be able to say these are people with OCD versus not. And guess what, right? They couldn't differentiate because what they found is that those of us that have intrusive thoughts and have OCD, our thoughts aren't any different, but it's really the power we give to them. And I think that's really important for maybe for you to speak to for a second and just to go back to the basics of what do oftentimes those of us with OCD do that actually give our thoughts power and make these thoughts different than people without OCD? And then what is kind of the basis of ERP and, and undoing that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so, you know, like you said, we all have these kinds of thoughts. I was going to mention a long time ago, we did research on new parents and we found that pretty much all new parents, moms and dads, by the way, had thoughts about awful things happening to their newborns, including doing awful things, 
uh, you're burping your baby and what if I pound him on the back or you sexually molest your baby or you put the baby in the microwave or stuff like that, we had one person say. And these were people who didn't have OCD. These were new parents. They didn't have OCD and they still had those kinds of thoughts. How did I get interested in that? Because, and I'm not someone who has OCD, I happen to not have it, but I remember sitting there and burping my child uh, when um, it was just she and I awake at, at three in the morning, my wife was asleep. And I got the thought, what if I reared back and slapped her? Like, no one's keeping me from doing this. I was like, aha, this is one of those, this is one of those thoughts. And it turns out that, you know, most dads and moms have those kinds of thoughts. Turns out that folks who have OCD, they make some critical mistakes in the way that they interpret these thoughts. They see them as being really significant. So this is personally relevant because I think about this. This means something about me. I'm a horrible, dirty, violent, crazy person, and I need to um, you know, take precautions. Otherwise, I'm going to do something terrible or something bad's going to happen. That's one way that people make, make mistakes about their thoughts. Another way is they think they should be able to control those thoughts. And you've probably all done this experiment, right, where try not to think about a pink elephant. And of course, the first thing that comes to mind is a pink elephant. So people who say, I should be able to control these thoughts. I got to get rid of these blasphemous thoughts. Then all they think about are the blasphemous thoughts. And then that just reinforces this idea that I'm a terrible, a terrible person because all I can think about are these terrible things. And then the third way uh, that people have of misinterpreting their, their thoughts is that they sometimes think that thinking about it somehow makes it more likely to happen. So if I think about my wife having a car accident, and if I think about it you know, really hard, or if I say, I hope Stacy has a car accident, I just said it, then somehow that's gonna make it happen. Um, and of course, you know, that doesn't make sense. That's, that's a um, dysfunctional way of thinking and interpreting thoughts. And so the idea of exposure therapy is to help people to lean in and purposely confront these fears and change those beliefs, learn, hey, you know what? I don't have to worry about these thoughts. They're just, they're mental noise basically in our mind. I call them brain farts sometimes. Um, and so um, we can treat these thoughts just like any other senseless thought. But they, what they do is they, they attack where we're the most vulnerable because they're the thoughts that are about the things we care about the most. If you have a new baby, that's what you're going to be thinking about, terrible thoughts about the baby. If you're religious, you're going to be thinking about what's wrong with your relationship with God or some sort of, you know, expletive towards God. If you're a, a, a sensitive person, you're going to think about sense, uh, harmful, violent thoughts, those kinds of things. And I, I and I think, so I think the two takeaways that really helped me when I was in treatment understand is that, okay, my thoughts aren't unique. It does, it's not something wrong with me that I'm having these thoughts, right? The thoughts people without OCD have, but the reality is, is the way I respond to the thoughts are the difference. And for me, what the freedom that came with that was me being able to understand that, oh, I also get to choose how I respond, right? And so that choice is the difference in treatment, right? I can choose, and it doesn't mean I'm perfect, right? I still, as somebody with the background that I have, I still give in sometimes. The anxiety is really high and you, you, you know, sometimes you ritualize, but the reality is, is that I know ritual relief is temporary and it really makes me get much more stuck and much more uncertain versus the long-term relief that comes if I choose not to ritualize. And I, so, so it's just so important we recognize that, that, okay, these thoughts everybody has, but the reason these thoughts become so powerful is because of the way I respond to them. And so if we change the response, we can also change the power and the frequency that they come with. And that's really why I entered the field. I thought it was just so fascinating that we could actually engage in treatment that changes the way people think, right? Like it, it and it works. Can you speak a little bit to just what it's been like for you to see success of patients and, um, severity levels and the way it can go, we can go from totally non-functioning to completely functioning with this treatment? Sure, sure. And I'll just say that that's actually one of the things that fascinates me the most um, about OCD and working with people uh, is you see exactly the same thing. Um, but people, once people realize that these are just thoughts that everyone has and I don't have to do anything about them, I don't have to do rituals, I can see them for what they really are, um, it's almost like a light goes on, not with everybody, um, but with lots of people, if they are willing to, to take that really difficult step and confront their fears. 
then they learn, I don't have to worry about this. And the change can be, I've, I've seen it be very, very abrupt. Um, like I said, not everybody. I, for me, the hardest part is convincing people to try this out because they've spent a long, long time doing the opposite, trying to avoid trying to push these thoughts away. And so, you know, someone, let's say, actually, I'm currently working with someone who has a, a you know, blas has blasphemous thoughts, what she considered as, considers to be blasphemous thoughts. And it's really, it's I, I, I get it, it's really difficult for her to actually do things that would make her think about these thoughts um, and, and see that, that it's okay, it's not like something awful is gonna happen, there's not gonna be a lightning bolt or anything like that for her. Um, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it can be very, very effective. And I think the beauty of it all is that usually when we fully engage in ERP and lean in and we're not ritualizing, that's when the light goes off because we see, oh, this actually worked. Like it didn't make sense. Why would I purposely think about what I'm scared of? But, oh, I, you know, I can get it. And then we can see how it can relate to and continue to work with other areas of OCD. And that actually brings me to a point that I think is really important. I was leading group this morning at the clinic and I was talking about it as well, is us really not getting discouraged by lapses. And, you know, I think that as we imagine what's going to happen in the next six months, year, however long, as we start to return to normal, I think that we can expect that a lot of people with, even without OCD, are going to have triggers and weird things happen that they hadn't expected or experienced previously, but that people with OCD may experience some, some lapses, right? Sometimes where they have, uh, they're feeling vulnerable, stressed overall, and so their OCD increases, or maybe they used to or have never dealt with contamination OCD, and it pops up around the virus. And can we just speak a little bit to that about, like, how people differentiate between a lapse and a relapse, but even though I don't know that that's as important as really, what do we do when we see a lapse and, and how do we get back on track? Sure, so lapses are, are normal for, for everyone, even in the best circumstances. Um, lots of folks that I work with, I'll hear from six months, a year, maybe a couple of years down the road, hey, I'm having trouble with, with such and such. And during the last few sessions of, of therapy, we usually talk about how expect lapses. It's not a matter of if, but when, and one of the things that we know is that these lapses tend to happen when there's more stress. And, you know, this whole ordeal has been stressful, but I think that coming out of it, and maybe people are kind of overlooking this, that's going to be really stressful too. Whether, whether or not you have OCD, it's going to be stressful. But especially if, if you have OCD and it pertains to, to the virus, um, now, you know, maybe the expectations are going to change. You're going to be expected to, whether it's, you know, go back to work or other people in your family are going to want to have guests over and things like that. And I think, you know, if, you're, if, if you've been doing therapy, it's important to recognize this is a lapse. I got I to gotta do some exposures. I got to make sure or check in with a therapist if you haven't in a while. So recognize it as a lapse. Don't panic because lapses, they simply mean I got to work a little bit harder. I got to get back, you know, back into that, into that groove. Um, so that the lapses don't turn into relapses, which I think of a relapse as being where you're back to baseline. And a lapse is kind of a temporary, you know, and, and hopefully on your own, uh, if you do some exposures and kind of really dive into where you feel like that lapse is coming up, um, you can hopefully manage that on your own. But it's, there's no harm and, and, um, and no shame in calling a therapist, getting in touch with someone you've worked with, uh, working with a family member who can kind of coach you. Uh, to try to get back on that on that horse. Hundred percent. And you know, mm -hmm. I I speak openly about the fact that I continue to go to therapy every week, and it's important for me and my mental health. And I I really um, it keeps me my accountability, right? It's really my like accountability tool. Of, are you doing your work? Make sure you don't let life and work and your your busyness get in the way. And for me, you know, there's many times where I taper down and I'm going to treatment once once a month or or whatever it might be. But I also know that for myself, you know, not right now, but I remember when I was doing my postdoc at the VA and I was very triggered by some situations, you know, I up treatment to twice a week and there's no shame in that. You know, for me, it's about saying, hey, I see my OCD increasing and I know that this is I'm on the path of a relapse right now. Right. If I don't manage it, I'm going to revert back to square one. So instead let me kind of up the ante, right? Let me figure out what I need to do to get it back under control as quick as possible. And as, as an advocate, that's something I speak so much about is that 
if you had diabetes and you were doing well and managing your symptoms and all of a sudden you were having a lot of difficulties, right? Your blood sugar was spiking and you were struggling to manage it the way you previously had, would you feel shame about calling your doctor and going and visiting with them and coming up with a new plan and figuring out what you needed to do now to manage your symptoms? I hope not. And and we need to think about our brain the same way. We need to treat it the same way as we do our body. And I think what Dr. Bramowitz was mentioning that's really my take home is that expect lapses. You know, don't ever think that you're going to go to treatment and be cured and that you're going to go to treatment. And if you struggle later, then that means treatment didn't work. No, go to treatment and expect that you're going to have tough days and you're going to have times where you, even your insight or like, the way you engage in treatment goes out the window, right? Where we just ritualize and it just happens, but the tools never leave you. So you can always pick them back up. Sometimes you do it on your own, sometimes with a friend or sometimes with your provider, but don't let struggle uh, mean that you've totally relapsed. My favorite analogy from my dietitian when I was trying to kind of learn how to eat better and, and take care of myself as a young adult, I remember I said, you know, well, I already had ate, eaten bad, so it just didn't matter. I figured, like, forget it. I'll try again next Monday. And she's like, oh, yeah, that's the classic response. And so I have a question for you. And I was like, okay, what is it? She said, so Liz, if you were driving to Austin and you got a flat tire, would you slit the other three? <laughs> and I was like, well, no, that's a bit ridiculous. And she's like, but it's really not. What would you do? I'm like, well, I'd fix the tire and get back on the road. She's like, exactly, right? You you I see where your issues are. You fix them and you move forward. You don't just say, oh, well, now I'm just, it's it's over. I might as well just let it keep snowballing. I love I love that. And, and um, actually, I, I might steal that from you. And Please. You, Julie. Um, but I, you said something else that I just want to reinforce. And that is that when when you're, Getting over OCD, when you're doing therapy, you're learning skills that you're gonna use for a lifetime. And we, we wanna think about exposure therapy, not as like you're in therapy and then boom, you're out of therapy and it's over and you move on. But for most people, these are gonna be skills that you wanna continue to, to use. It's like you wanna have that exposure lifestyle rather than that avoidance lifestyle. Right. And um, you, you, know, you never know when you're gonna need that and so keep those tools at your disposal all the time. And that's really the key. You know, the two things that I think are critical is, you know, when you're exercising, if you're in an exercise regimen, you do the same thing every day and you see great results. Oftentimes people talk about a plateau, right? Where like, oh, now I have to work a different body, body group or I have to switch things up to see results. With OCD, it's the same, right? You have the toolkit, but the way you apply it does look different depending on the triggers and depending on the situation. And we hear this all the time where people will say, you know, well, when I went to treatment, I had contamination OCD and I could handle that. I could do it. But now I have harm to self OCD and I don't have any tools for how to handle this. And the classic response from providers is, yes, you do. It's the same tools, but we just have to tweak how they look, right? And what applying them looks like. And so be flexible. And this is really about self-compassion too, of being kind to yourself and not just saying, okay, I've learned nothing, treatment didn't work. And instead saying, okay, what do I have and how can I apply this now? Amen. All right, so let's hop into some more questions. Um, hi, everybody, people from Belgium and Maine. Oh, wow. and place, which is great. So at 1142, Leslie said, what causes triggers or triggers OCD? Is it environmental? Is it genetics? And, um, you know, no one ever likes my answer, which is usually, I don't know, and we don't necessarily know, but would love to hear yours. We don't know. Um, we, we have some guesses. Uh, there are some, there are plenty of biological models. Is it, is it genes? Well, it's not, there's not an OCD gene. OCD is not something, you know, like eye color where there's a gene, you know, for green eyes or blue eyes or brown eyes or stuff like that. It just doesn't work that way. Um, is it serotonin problems? Well, there's been lots of research since like the 70s and 80s, and there's not good data that serotonin, people with OCD have um, problems with their serotonin. Their serotonin seems to be working just fine like everyone else's. Um, is it a problem with the structure or the function of the brain? There's some really interesting studies. If you, if you, um, you know, uh, get groups of people, you know, group of people with OCD, group of people without, and you, uh, you know, you scan their brains, you will see differences in, in what their brain is doing and all that. I say, well, of course you will, because people with OCD are more anxious and they're thinking about lots of stuff and um, that's going to make the brain look different. 
What there's no evidence from those studies is that that causes the OCD. There's actually interesting research showing that if you take people who don't have anxiety, don't have clinical anxiety, and you make them anxious, their brain, and, and you scan them, their brain looks just like someone who does have problems with clinical anxiety. So it's actually a good bet that those brain scan studies, they're, they're only correlational and we can't assume causation from correlation, but it's actually a good bet that it's the OCD that's producing changes. And, and these are temporary changes just with your, your mood uh, in, in the brain, as opposed to not. There's no good evidence that there's something wrong, um, a structure, a function that's, that's specific to OCD. We don't have a biological test. Now, we also have to say the same thing about learning theories, about environmental theories. Is it something your parents did? No, probably not. It, it, um, then you would see like lots more people with OCD than just two to three percent of the population. Is it some sort of learning experience that you had? Well, people with and without OCD all have similar learning experiences and lots of lots of overlap. But again, you see it in only about two and two to three percent of people who have OCD. So it is probably my the John Abramowitz theory is that it's a combination of lots of factors. We're, I, I don't really think it's worth trying to figure it out because I think it's probably different for different people, how much of one versus the other. And I think that biology works in a general way. So there probably are some genetic predispositions to um, having the anxiety dial kind of turned up. And then if you're in the right circumstances, you're having the right learning experiences where maybe you learn that thoughts are really you know, important and things like that. Um, probably combinations like that. I, um, I don't know, I, just, I, I, I tend to focus more on treatments because we know the treatment works regardless of what the cause is. Um, and I know it's a hotly contested and people have lots of strong feelings. So that's just my opinion based on my read of the literature. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you, couldn't agree more. And the reality for most of us with OCD is that ERP and baseline, you know, first line recommended treatments work and they work really, really well. And so I always want to say like, don't get too stuck in the why because it doesn't always get us anywhere, right? It's it's not solvable right now. Once we know why, then sure, maybe that'd be interesting to know. But otherwise, if we don't know the answer, uh, try to move on and figure out the things we do know answers for, which are things like how to treat your illness. Agreed. All right, so at 11.43 a.m., how do you accept uncertainty? I'm, ho I'm hoping to start ACT and aspects of DBT soon as I'm currently in ERP, but I find I continue to develop new obsessions because I cannot accept uncertainty. Right. I would say that you can accept uncertainty, and you do. If you're alive, you accept uncertainty. We all do. Um, you, probably don't even you probably don't even realize it. If you ever cross the street, you're accepting uncertainty. You're taking, a, a, you know, it's a risk. We don't think about it as a risk. If you plug something into an outlet, if you climb up a flight of stairs or go down a flight of stairs, people every day in the world, someone falls down a flight of stairs and dies. It's a terrible thing. But uh, I don't mean to make light of it, but um, we all take risks. We don't think of them as risks. Um, it's just that what, what OCD does is to make you feel like what what your OCD is focused on those obsessions that that's an even greater uh, risk than than everyday risk and, and it probably isn't so you probably know I'm not saying that it's easy to kind of make that leap but you probably what what I tell folks is we want you to learn that use the same skills that you use when you get in that car to drive to the therapy session for example right and you figure oh I'm probably going to make it right you probably don't even think about that I'm probably going to get there alive and get home alive. Um, you want to be able to apply that to other areas. I'm not saying it's easy, but you do know how to live with uncertainty. Everyone does. And I think the thing is, is that sometimes it feels like we can't lean into certain uncertainties because we're beyond anxious about it or super triggered. And I, I think it's really important for us to address as well that when we're talking about OCD treatment and we're talking about ERP, it's done slowly and systematically. And this is why we often use tools like a hierarchy or different things, but really the goal is not that you do one session and you're not afraid of anything anymore, right? It's it's a process and you do that together with your treatment provider, but it is so critical. And I speak about this all the time because I think we, we, this message gets lost, which is that 
an exposure that's a low level exposure for you with ritual prevention is so much better than a mid or high level one that you engage in rituals around. And I think a lot of us with OCD struggle with that because it's like, yeah, but let me just do this high level one. It's, you know, I did it. I was successful but then I ritualized. Well, then it really wasn't successful, right? We actually just reinforced our fear and reinforced our OCD versus I'd much rather someone do a lower level one and be successful so you can move up. So the question really I would pose is what level of uncertainty are you willing to take right now? And lean into that. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. You shouldn't have, you, you should never be doing OCD exposures that cause you no anxiety because that's not an exposure, right? It's the point of treatment is to challenge yourselves and to feel uncomfortable. But what level of uncomfortability are you willing to feel without giving a response to? And that's where you want to start because as, as John mentioned, we, we take risks every day. We're just not equating them when it's OCD. And I always think of this because, um, I started a support group in Houston a long, long time ago. And when we, when I used to run the group and one of the things we would hear all the time is, well, I wish I had your OCD. Well, I wish I had that person's OCD. And the reality is, is that of course you do because your OCD is the worst, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean theirs isn't worse than yours or vice versa. There's no way we can compare it, but what we're struggling with in the moment. And we hear this all the time where people will say, well, you know, I am just so stuck with this contamination OCD that I wish it was my old fear of this because that was no problem. Well, no, that was a struggle too. It's just that you've you've overcome that. So it doesn't feel scary anymore. And so you'll be able to get there, but just stick with it and slowly and systematically lean in. All right. So Kathy at 1144, can we talk a little bit about handling OCD in the workplace with employers, coworkers, et cetera, during this time? What accommodations do you think we can reasonably seek out? Can we be fired if our work is compromised due to mental health and or advocate for following CDC guidelines as opposed to business policy? Great question. Um, I, wow. I I mean, the last part about advocating for CDC guidelines, I, I think that's probably important, especially if the guidelines are more rigorous if if the policy is being a little bit more kind of liberal about you don't have to wear a mask you know but the guidelines in your area are you have to wear you you have to wear a mask and i would definitely um uh you know try to make sure that the business is is kind of following whatever the law of the land is um uh, there was a multi-part question i'm now i'm I'm forgetting And I'll address some of it as well. You know, I think my my short answer is like, I just don't know. I think that we don't totally know what businesses are going to be required to follow, you know, and I think oftentimes businesses can make their own choice and have that freedom, but they should certainly be following the guidelines of local government. And I think that's important. So I think in Texas, a lot of people right now might say, well, wait a second, um, you know, we should you should be required to wear a mask at work because CDC is saying that it's important. But the reality is, is that uh, in Texas, it's not a requirement. It's not the law. And so people don't have to do it. But again, that doesn't mean you don't have to, or that doesn't mean you can't, um, you know, address it appropriately. And I think, you know, I, I want to kind of go back to the OCD part because I think it's really important for us to address this because I get this all the time is like, what can we advocate for? What's reasonable? What, um, what does ADA cover when it comes to our disability? And I always take a stance that surprises people here because I'm somebody who lives with OCD, but my stance is actually that I think that it's important that people support our illness, right? So um, as an employer, I always advocate for going to therapy, doing things like that, that, that are going to be critical and that are really important. But as an individual with OCD, I'm also, I'm also really cautious to ask for too many accommodations because that can also become enabling, right? So it's one thing to ask for reasonable accommodations and to say, you know, this is too difficult for me right now, or can I do this instead? Or, you know, if there's, if there's an opportunity that's there, but you also don't want to get into a world where you're not having to do any tasks that trigger you because that's just going to allow OCD to have total control, right? The same thing we would tell parents with their kiddos is sure at the beginning, you might make more accommodations when they're first getting into treatment and you're learning the process. But the goal eventually is that we're not enabling and we're not cleaning for you, or we're not cooking all the food for you. And we're wanting you to touch stuff and to live because that's a important for your functioning, but I don't know where you stand on it. No, I completely agree. I think a good analogy 
is, you know, let's imagine if someone breaks their leg, right? And they have to be in a wheelchair and, you know, for, for a month or two. And, and of course, the rest of the family is going to step up and they're going to do things for that, for that person. They're going to wheel them around. They're going to, you know, make it easy for them, help them to get into bed, help them, you know, do their, their tasks. And then the, their, their, the cast comes off and, and they have to go to uh, rehab, right? And, and physical therapy. Now, if the family is doing all these things for them, still helping them so much, they're actually getting in the way because that person has to learn how to put more weight on their leg and how to increase the, those muscles and, um, and all of that. So there comes a time when, as you said, uh, we, we want to kind of dial back the accommodation. That said, I, I do think that, um, I think the, there was a comment in, the, in that question about like, can I be fired if I do this? I don't, I don't think so. I think you would have some sort of legal recourse if it was clear, if you could make the case that you're fired because, because you have OCD. Uh, hopefully it wouldn't get to, to that point. Um, but I don't know if that helped. And I will say the International OCD Foundation has a couple really good articles as well on this. And the Peace of Mind Foundation, actually this week, one of the um, our new content that's been added is um, from a psychologist who speaks specifically about kind of the laws and the way to advocate for yourself um, throughout throughout life with OCD. And so definitely check those out. But the reality is, is that what I always say is ask for reasonable accommodations, but accommodations that would still challenge you and that are there's still a goal that they will be removed eventually, because otherwise I think we can get a little bit too dependent on them and that may not be uh, super helpful for our symptoms. Okay. All right, so at 1145, Simon said, what should we do if other people are asking us to engage in excessive washing while we're trying to treat our contamination OCD? And I smile because I love this question and I think it's really important that we, we figure out and learn how to set boundaries for ourselves and other people as well when they actually may be encouraging us to now do OCD rituals versus guidelines. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that it's, you know, it, it, it's okay to, to explain and kind of say, well, I'm, I'm go this is, um, I'm, maybe I'm working on kind of not being so afraid. Um, I, you know, it's, I have to think about this, but I think I would probably say I'm, I'm working on not being concerned. I'm one, I'm someone who washes my hands a lot and I'm trying to prove to myself that I can kind of cut back. So thank you. But I, I don't know. I, I'm curious what you would think. That's, it's, it's a tough question. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think if I'm said, then we have to do it. Yes. And <laughs> I think that this is about us advocating for ourselves, right? It's about us saying like, I'm following guidelines and at the same time, I'm not letting fear and OCD take control of my life. And so I've cleaned enough. If you want to do additional cleaning, feel free, you know, and that's really where I take the stance is like, even with my OCD, if I feel like my fiance needs to do more and I'm triggered by him, it's also that it's not accept, like that's my role. Like I can choose to do the ritual or not, but I shouldn't be asking him to ritualize for me. We also shouldn't be allowing other people to encourage us to ritualize because we know that's gonna be detrimental to our recovery, right? And so same thing I've told people, it's okay on a text thread to say, hey guys, like love you, but I'm gonna leave this text thread because conversations about COVID are just too triggering for me. When some people's friend groups, all they do is talk about COVID all day and share news stories and it's not helpful. That's about advocating for you. And it sounds like you already know that like this isn't helpful and this isn't okay. And you can set that parameter and you don't have to, to do rituals for other people. Um, guidelines are one thing, rituals are another. All right. So one of the other main questions that we get often is um, when somebody um, is using sleep as a respite from their intrusive thoughts, how much sleep can I allow without being concerned that it's a depressive behavior? And I'm curious about how we kind of address this, especially in this situation. So this is talking about a child home from college and not having as much time to occupy the day. I know college kids might sleep more than than I do. But like what what is it like and when, a great question of really like, when should we be concerned about certain symptoms? It, it is a great question. I would be less concerned with the number of hours of sleep and more concerned about the function of the, of the sleep. So why is the person, um, you know, how are they using sleep? I'm having bad thoughts now and I need to escape from them. And the way I do it is by going to sleep. So goodbye, I'm going to sleep. Not a good thing. Right. Um, I, I, you know, enjoy my, my sleep and nowadays I can because I'm home from college or I don't have a lot of work. Um, that's okay. I don't get too concerned about that. Again, it's 
good to kind of keep hours with the rest of society. So unless you have a job where you're on the third shift, you know, probably going to bed sometime in the, you know, late evening, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock or so, waking up sometime in the morning with the sun. Usually, I think a good rule of thumb. Some people are a little bit different, but I think it's the function right. rather than the number of hours. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, one of the questions about medication, so we're going to skip that one, but we I know it says you don't have a psychiatrist to consult with, so I would encourage you to find one or call your local community mental health clinics. Um, otherwise, we also have a couple wonderful webinars by Dr. Jenneke and others on Peace of Mind that you can watch to learn more about medication. Next question, um, and I'm actually going to put two in one, is that a lot of people are afraid of going outside right now. And so how do we handle that? But also how do we reduce panic attacks and OCD during this time? And I'm, I'm putting them together because I think the answer is the same thing, which is, um, no, I'll let you answer it. No, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, my, my answer would just be ERP and don't avoid, right? Don't, um, you know, don't follow guidelines, but don't go beyond that. Because again, if we are allowed to go outside, but we're scared to, and that's the reason we're no longer going outside, we know that's a recipe for disaster. And it's just going to be something we have to face later. And, um, and again, the more we don't avoid and we still engage in activities that are allowed, that will also reduce OCD and panic attacks because we're again, living this lifestyle of exposure that you spoke about earlier. Well said. If you look, if you think about the the pros and cons and the, the the cost and benefit of going outside, and I assume this just means going out for a walk or something like this, um, or even going to the store, I would say the the costs of avoiding that, especially if you have OCD, because that we know that avoidance just kind of makes OCD worse and teaches you to be more afraid. Um, the costs of avoiding that are much greater than the risk of, of getting the, the virus. Um, I sincerely believe that. Uh, going outside, you know, be smart. So don't have like a pack of people that you're walking around with and breathing all over. If you're, if there's a jogger jogging past you, move over to the side because we know that they're kind of blowing out lots of air because they're huffing and puffing. And, you know, they're unlikely, if they're jogging, they're unlikely to be affected by the virus. But you know, if you want to be that, that's, I think that's something that is a reasonable precaution to, to take, but yeah, go outside. And what, and what was the part about the panic attacks? How can we avoid panic yeah. attacks? So how do we manage panic attacks oh. and OCD during this time? Yeah. So panic attacks are, um, they're really unpleasant. They are um, not dangerous. They are your fight or flight response. And so the best way to manage anxiety, to manage panic attacks, is to learn about what's actually happening when you're having a panic attack, uh, which is so your, your heart's pounding, your breathing increases a lot, you might feel dizzy, you might sweat, you might have racing thoughts, you might have this extreme fear and, and urge to escape from the situation. All of those are part of, of your body's fight or flight response. They won't hurt you. They're there to protect you from harm. A panic attack is a false alarm for that. And so I encourage folks to learn. There's some really good um, self-help books for, for panic attacks um, that uh, I will think of as we talk. And I, and I can say a little bit later on, it's somehow slipping my mind. Um, but uh, yeah, panic attacks, once we learn, and, and that's what exposure therapy, cognitive behavior therapy for panic, is all about. It's teaching people not to be afraid of panic attacks and not to, just like with these intrusive thoughts that we've been talking about, not to try to push the anxiety away, but instead to lean into it. This is really uncomfortable, but it's temporary. It's not harmful. And this is going to pass if I just kind of let myself be with this and understand what's happening. 100%. And I think, you know, I think that again, what you're going to hear over and over is anxiety scary, but anxiety is not dangerous. And more importantly, right, if we avoid it, it just gets bigger, right? It just becomes scarier and bigger. And if we face it and live a lifestyle of exposures across in different ways, they will come less frequently, right? That's really what the treatment is all about. Um, so I'm going to just quickly answer a couple questions as we jump to jump to some others. But Rajan, um, you know, I think that having thoughts, not necessarily intrusive and vagueness about your career. This is all, it may fall under the category of kind of generalized anxiety disorder, but again, treat it as anxiety, right? So in that, and when I say that, I mean like 
address the thoughts, figure like with our career, sometimes there is a lot of uncertainty and there's normal anxiety that's healthy. And I think that's important that we don't assume we're never going to have anxiety in the future. Some anxiety is normal, some anxiety is healthy. So use some of those same tools you have, right? So, um, okay, this is the thought. Do I have a plan? Can I address it and move forward versus getting stuck, right? Getting stuck and ruminating becomes where these thoughts can be more destructive. Um, other people are sharing lots of great insight about how OCD can morph. It can be around fears of having another disorder um, and really people talking about how wonderful ERP is and how much it works. Um, and the next question I want us to address is from Aaron at 1151 Chelsea. It's how do you teach people to deal with intrusive thoughts about possibly having done something in the past? No confirmed memory, but a, oh my gosh, if what if I did this as a child or a young adult or fears that they, um, that their children might, fears about their children doing harm someday? Yeah. Um, so it, if I can just first say the, the workbook, I said I'd mention a workbook. Um, uh, the Anti-Anxiety Workbook by Marty Antony. A-N-T-O-N-Y, and Peter Norton is um, one of the ones that I usually um, recommend to people, the Anti-Anxiety Workbook. Um, yeah, so I think we, we can think about these kinds of thoughts about stuff in the past, uh, just like we would think about other sorts of intrusive thoughts about stuff in the future. There's uncertainty. I, you know, no one has a perfect memory. No one has a perfect memory. And although I don't think that I have ever poisoned my kids, I, I can't, I just can't be a hundred percent sure that I didn't poison my just because I don't think I've killed anyone in my in my life doesn't mean that I can be a, I can never be a hundred percent sure. What if in my sleep I murdered someone and, and haven't gotten caught, no one figured it out and buried the body really well? Again, unlikely. But so what we want to do is we want to help people to be able to lean into these kinds of thoughts, too, and lean into the uncertainty that, you know, most likely this is just noise. And I'm thinking about it because I'm so worried about it. And Liz, as you mentioned, I'm thinking about it a lot because I'm trying to push it away, because this thought bothers me so much. That's the only reason that I'm thinking about it so much. But um, I can live with the with the uncertainty that I probably didn't do it. Emphasis on the probably because we can never have a guarantee. I know it sounds kind of silly to say, you know, I probably didn't kill anyone, but the truth is, I can't, I can't guarantee that. Neither can, neither can anyone else, you or anyone else watching this. We just don't have, we, we just don't have that guarantee because we don't have the, the, the videotapes. And even if we did, OCD would say, well, maybe the, the, the video camera stopped working for five minutes, and that's when you killed somebody. We've all worked with patients who, who worry about that too. So there's just no getting a guarantee. So exposure CBT is about learning how to be better at the uncertainty uh, that those thoughts trigger. 100%. And I think the critical piece here, right, is again about uncertainty. It's about leaning in, but also that these are common OCD thoughts. And I think that's really important. I think sometimes when we're talking about sexual intrusive thoughts or memory thoughts, they aren't always easily identified as OCD. And so people think like this is unique and no one else has this, but these are common OCD thoughts. And so we want to treat them as OCD and lean into the uncertainty around them. Yeah. There's been so many other amazing questions um, and comments. And so I appreciate everybody sharing their successes and how they're doing. Let's hop to Paul at 1205. And if you can speak a little bit, Dr. Bramwitz, to inhibitory learning and OCD. Yeah. What what did Paul say? I'm skipping over to his... That's it. Just said, can you talk briefly? Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Yeah. So inhibitory learning. So, uh, you know, inhibitory learning is a way of thinking about how exposure therapy works. And we know that when someone is afraid, and I'm going to talk about something uh, more simple than OCD, let's say a child who's afraid of dogs, right? So, you know, somehow they learn to be afraid of dogs because that's how we become afraid of dogs, either we get bit by a dog or we see it happen or we hear about it or stuff like that. That's how phobias develop. So I have this idea in my, in my mind, dogs are dangerous, dogs are gonna bite me, that kind of thing. When we do exposure therapy, which in this case would be hanging out with a dog to see that it's really unlikely to get bitten, what we've learned from research on human memory and cognition is that exposure doesn't erase that old memory, that old fear that the dog's dangerous. What it does is, it gives us new learning, oh, dogs are safe. So in your mind, you have dogs are dangerous, 
and dogs are safe. Inhibitory learning is the idea that we want to do exposure in a way that the new learning, dogs are safe, inhibits or pushes down that old learning that dogs are dangerous. And there are different ways that, that we can do that type of exposure. Um, and there are some papers that kind of describe and some books that kind of describe how, how to do that. I'll just talk about it a little, really briefly. Um, one is that the more we do exposure in different contexts, so with different dogs, for example, and in different locations, you're more likely to learn that dogs are safe because you have more experiences with different dogs and the mind learns safety better when we experience safety in different contexts. Also, um, doing exposure with um, multiple different stimuli. So having two dogs around, it's gonna be better than having one dog. And we know that that when we have multiple um, uh, fearful stimuli, that's better than just having one uh, fear stimuli. It also turns out that learning to be better at fear itself uh, is a really good way of inhibiting the old learning. So learning that anxiety itself isn't dangerous and that we can manage the anxiety. So we're going for fear tolerance as opposed to habituation of anxiety. And one of the things that's often you know, uh, a big point about inhibitory learning is that we're not so concerned about the SUDs, subjective units of discomfort, which you often do in exposure therapy. We're not so concerned about seeing that go down. Instead, we want the person to learn something new you know, during the exposure. And that new learning is often, it's okay if the SUDs don't go down. I can be okay if my anxiety stays up here. Anxiety is safe and manageable. So it's a new way of thinking about exposure. I, I wouldn't say that it should replace the old kind of habituation or what we call emotional processing theory, but it's just more tools in our tool bag to use with, with exposure. And I really think that, you know, a lot of us have been doing this for years, right, in different ways. But really, when you think about OCD treatment overall, and, and the biggest pitfall, in my opinion, is that a lot of people will say, I want you to fix my anxiety. I want you to fix my OCD. And this is goes directly back to kind of the lapses and these other important things we've talked about, which is that there is not a fix, right? You're not going to never have an intrusive thought. You're not going to never feel anxious. And in fact... The point of treatment is not to get rid of your anxiety. The point of treatment is for us to kind of embrace anxiety and to learn that anxiety is okay and that anxiety is not dangerous and that we don't have to respond to it. And I think that's the critical piece in, in all of the ways we treat OCD that really makes the big difference is once we understand that and accept that, that's where we really see the big results. And so we are going to wrap it up with that. I went through most of the questions and I think we've addressed all of them. And I will say the ones that we didn't, I really want you guys to focus focus a couple other questions about how do we work on this or how do we treat this, use ERP, use OCD treatment. It still remains the same no matter what category and type of OCD you have. We've gone ahead and posted some of my favorite books. So the first one that I wanted us to um, really talk about is actually the one that Dr. Brown was talked about. So we posted a link for the anti-anxiety workbook that you guys can click on. We've also posted Getting Over OCD, um, which is an amazing self-help workbook by Dr. Bramowitz that we use here at our clinic and we really recommend for peace of mind. I think it's the best one out there. And then as far as a textbook, I often recommend Freedom from OCD by Dr. Grayson, which is also posted. A couple of people asked questions about like, do scripts work and are scripts helpful? Absolutely. And I think his book does a really good job of helping you see like how to lay out a script and what they can look like for OCD treatment. As always, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on today, John. We are so grateful for your knowledge, your willingness to talk to all of us and to share everything that you do with the community. Thank you so much. Thanks. It's my pleasure. I feel like we share a brain because we agree on like all this stuff. So that's always fun. Well, that's a good thing, right? It means we're, we're all doing the same thing, just in different areas, serving lots of people. So thank you for all that you do. And I know we'll continue to be in touch. Everybody awesome. else, please let us know how we can help please go to iocdf.org or peaceofmind.com and send us a message. Let us support you and help you get the treatment that you need. As always, I'll leave today with the same message I always do, which is that help and hope are always available. Take care.